Good morning to be here. Good place to be. Right place to be on Sunday morning. Uh, today's lesson is May 30th, 2021. It's the 13th lesson in the book and the last lesson in this book. Don't know if we've gotten the new ones in yet. Okay. I wasn't sure. I haven't asked you it. They changed the format, so you better get it studied out. Uh, I only changed. But, uh, the text is Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 58. The focus is 13, 48 through 58. Key verses, Matthew 13, 57. And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. The application is a student will identify the nature of the kingdom of God and understand how God's children will be treated in the world. A first look. Our understanding of the kingdom of heaven begins with the preaching of, of the word of God. This is taught in the parable of the sower. The seed is the word of God, and the various soils re represent the conditions of the hearts of those who hear the message of the gospel. When we repent of our sins and trust Jesus as our Savior, we are born again, and we begin to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Jesus then gave us parables that in instruct us about the consistency of the kingdom during the church age. These are found in verses 24 through 43 of this chapter, and they contain very interesting and revealing messages. Remember that the first, very first parable gives us a pattern for interpreting the others. In our lesson today, we come to parables that deal with the end of this age and the time when the spiritual kingdom will become physical. When Jesus comes again in glory, it will be an unveiling or a re revelation. The things that are true in the hearts of people will become obvious in their physical lives. Presently, we can see physical things while the spiritual part of life can only be observed through physical changes in the lives of believers. We see faith when it is expressed in works, in James 2, 18, which says, Ye, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have work, and I have works. Show, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. When Jesus comes in glory, we will see faith as easily as we can see works today. Jesus made an important point in the, in the parable of the tares. We are not to prejudge anything. We are to allow God's will to be done and know that God will separate truth from imitation and falsehood in the end of the world. Anything to add before we go ahead and get a closer look? Alrighty. Parables of the Kingdom, Matthew 13, 44 through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasures hid in a field, the which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant, merchant man seeking goodly pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels come, shall come forth and sever the wicked from amongst the just. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be a welling and gnashing of teeth. These verses mention three parables, all dealing with the kingdom of heaven. These parables are not teaching us how to be saved. Rather, they are dealing with our covenant relationship with God. This is an important and vital distinction. These parables often uh, offer us valuable lessons, but only if we interpret them properly. The first parable is about a hidden treasure. In this parable, a man discovers the presence of a great treasure and sold everything he had in order to buy the field and gain access to the treasure. Commonly, this, this parable is 
got to be about finding Christ as our Savior. But first, we must remember that Jesus is not really hidden. In fact, his life is among the most well-known and well-documented in history. Likewise, Jesus cannot be bought and sold. Everything we possess would not be enough to buy us access to the Lord. You can sit there and think about it, you know, you can be a good person, you can be super rich, you can be super poor, it doesn't change anything, whether you accept them or not. What you have in this world, it all does. You have anything else to add before we go on? Alrighty. The treasure in this parable is the relationship a saved person has with God through being a part of his covenant people. This is what it often referred to as a fellowship. Sadly, many of God's children who are truly born again never understand what a blessing and eternal treasure it is to be a part of a New Testament church. There was an Old Covenant, or Old Testament, and there is a New Testament. The New Testament is written in the blood of Jesus, and being a part of the New Covenant is more valuable than anything else we might possess. When we realize this, we will be willing to give up everything else in order to find this great treasure. This is what Jesus meant when he advised us to lay up treasures in heaven. That would never fade away. The second parable concerns a very costly pearl. A merchant found this pearl, and when he realized how valuable it was, he sold everything to buy this rare and unique jewel. Many poets have tried to make Jesus the pearl of great price, and that is a fascinating picture. But again, the interpretation fails when we realize that Jesus is not hidden, and he cannot be bought or sold. This pearl also represents our covenant relationship with Jesus through one of his churches. There are some interesting parallels taught in this parable. Unlike many other gems, a pearl is a unit. It cannot be carved or shaped. In, this, in the same way, each one of God's churches is a unique and complete local body. We cannot change or carve up the doctrines of the Bible to suit our needs or desires. A lot of people try, but it doesn't work. A pearl is the result of growth, not discovery. In the same way, God's churches grow gradually, becoming like spiritual buildings composed of many living stones. There are also many lesser pearls that might appear to be genuine, but the true churches of Jesus are the pearls of great price. When we understand the blessing of the kingdom of heaven, we will realize that the reward of being a part of that kingdom far outweigh any cost that may be involved. Does anyone have anything to add about the second parable there? I was thinking back to the first one about the, our, our relationship, our fellowship. I was thinking about what Paul said, you know, that I may know him and the, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You know, think about what Paul gave up in order to know him and his to have fellowship with him, you know. Paul could have been, you know, a well-known Pharisee. He could have had everything, but he gave up all that because he knew who Christ was and his desire was to know him even more, no matter the cost. It didn't, it didn't make a difference to him what the cost was. He, he wanted fellowship with him to know Jesus even more. And the thing about that parable that, of, of the pearl, about the growth and how, if you ever study how a pearl grows, it, it, it's because of an ear and then that, that clam or oyster puts a little growth on it. There's many different layers in that pearl. And, and as we grow as Christians you know, in the church, you know, there's, we're not always, shouldn't always be obeyed in Christ. We should continue to grow and, and always be putting on layers to be what God would have us to be in, in that, that pearl. You grow in life, you should grow in your spiritual walk with God too. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right, we'll go ahead with the third one. The third parable is about fishing and a net cast into the sea. The fishermen brought everything to the shore in the net, but they threw back the things that they did not want to keep. This teaches us that there are spiritual standards that are a part of the kingdom of heaven. Being in the net is not the same thing as being a good vessel. God does not recognize a group 
as a church unless the body conforms to the pattern given in the New Testament. There are heavenly standards, and not everyone will meet them. Jesus also taught this in the conclusion of to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 21-23, through 23, which I got here. I'm going to go ahead and read. Matthew 7, 21-23. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There are even people in churches who have never been saved at all. They are wicked people who are masquerading as just people. I have a big word and I've done it. I had to look that one up earlier. They will not fool the angels. At judgment, these people will receive the outcome of life choices they have made. All of these three parables are about choices. The men who bought the fields made a deliberate choice. The merchant who bought the pearl also made a choice. And like the fishermen who drew in the net, the spiritual choices we make will become obvious at the judgment. We should choose Jesus as our Savior, and we should choose to invest our lives in the truth of his word. Anything to add? All right, we'll go ahead and continue. New and Old Treasures, Matthew 13, 51 and 52. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. Then said unto him, said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. When he had finished these parables, Jesus asked those listening if they understood what he had taught them. He was asking them if their hearts were the good and fertile soil mentioned in the first parable. They answered that they did understand, and Jesus then gave them one last parable. Here he mentioned the scribes. The scribes went back to the time of Ezra. Their job was to copy and preserve the truth of the law and to help others apply their truth to their everyday lives. Over many years, the traditions of the Pharisees had become mixed in with the law of the Old Testament so that the scribes thought as highly of tradition as they did of the word of God. Jesus was not condemning the office of the scribes. Those in any age who have a part in preserving the word of God are doing a noble work. Instead, he was admonishing every one of his disciples to be a scribe in the real sense of the word. Jesus gave a parable about a householder or homeowner who had among his treasures both old things and new things. This was not a matter of choice. The householder did not throw away everything that was old. He did not reject things just because they were new. His home was operated wisely with the things that were suited for his purpose purposes, no matter what their age. New principles are found on old truths, and the wonderful things about truth is that this, that it is always true. This is what Jesus meant in John 5, 39 and 40, when he told the, told the Sadducees to search the scribes, and that the scriptures were just testifying about him. In John 5, 39 and 40, it says, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are, th and they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me that ye may have life. The scriptures are the word of God, and they are all profitable for us. The New Testament is based on the Old Testament. The Lord's churches were born out of Israel. God's truth is timeless and ageless. It never goes out of style, and it will never pass away. Anything to add before we go on to part three? 
Any thoughts or comments? All righty, we'll go ahead. Jesus at Nazareth, Matthew 13, 53 through 58. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogues, and so much that they were astonished and said, Whence hast thou, whence hast this man, this wisdom, and these mighty works? Is that not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brother James, and Hoseas, and Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence they hath this man all these things? And they were offered in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their, un because of their unbelief. After he finished teaching these parables, Jesus left this place and went again to his own country. This was the city of Nazareth. This is an interesting account because now Jesus had shifted his ministry away from the Jews and towards Jews and Gentiles alike. This does not mean that he was no longer concerned about Israel or that no more Jews could be saved. Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So now he went back to Nazareth to appeal to everyone who would listen. Jesus went into the synagogues and taught there. Perhaps he taught these same parables that he had instructed, introduced before. There were two things that stood out about Jesus' ministry in Nazareth. First was his wisdom. What Jesus had to say inherently made sense. This was in contrast to the convoluted teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees that defiled logic and reason. The question was about the source of Jesus' wisdom. Obviously, he was not schooled by the establishment of his day. The school, the second thing that amazed the people of Nazareth was the mighty works Jesus did. Jesus performed miracles no one else could. These mighty works were done in order to conform, confirm the words Jesus spoke. These people did not deny and could not deny that Jesus did what he claimed to do. They simply questioned the source of his ability to do these mighty works. I'm going to skip back up the paragraph there. I want to comment on something. You know, one of the things when I first announced my call to preach was Jeff asked me, he was like, hey, you know, what are you planning on doing? You know, what's he leading you to do? Are you going to go the rough road and just do pretty much what he done? You know, he didn't go to a school for, you know, we, I'm not going to a school for, we're not going to a college. Uh, the way I'm pretty much just doing it is just getting together with a group of guys on Saturdays that, have been called also, you know, you know, we just get together and we learn together. And, uh, you know, Jesus here, he didn't go to a college and he even made people question it. But, you know, Jesus had the answers and we too can have the answers because of Jesus. You know, we don't need to go to a school to be able to preach his word. We don't need to go to a school to be able to spread his word. So when you go out and talk to someone, you know, you don't need to sit there and worry, well, I didn't go to a school. I don't, you know, that doesn't matter, you know. God will give you the words to say if you just study his word. All my life I've always been asked, well, you're a preacher, where did you go to school? Yeah, that, that's ingrained in people anymore that if you're going to be a preacher, you need to go to school. I think there's nothing wrong with school. There's nothing wrong, wrong with an education. Everybody ought to get one. But I think one of the biggest problems with some of the preaching in our pulpits today is because People went to school to become a preacher instead of being called to be a preacher and they go to school. Uh, there's a difference. Yeah. You know, God needs to call a person to preach. And there's nothing wrong with education. It's a good, good, good one. Yeah, I wasn't talking bad about education. If you're smart enough to go, go right ahead. I didn't do good in high school. I don't need to go to a college. That's not the same. I'm saying not a preacher preach for 20 years and leave their back. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Not to make light up, going back to school. No, yeah. And better in their manager. You know, not, not to say that for everybody, but I had plenty in some cases. It's just a better, your understanding of the Bible to be able to spread the word better. <laughs> you know, if you feel led to go to a school, then go to a school, but 
if you're feeling led to go to a school and not to preach, you're not preaching. You're not a preacher. You need to be led by God to be a preacher. You need to be called by God. Yeah, just because you go to a school doesn't make you a preacher. It's the calling that makes yeah. the preacher, not the school. Yeah. All right. Anything else before I continue? I know the man that uh, told me and Joe that uh, he'd been thinking some way he something he could get into, make some easy money. And he said, uh, I think I found it at Angelistic uh, Television. Uh, get on the television, radio and television. <laughs> he yeah. wasn't even saved. He probably uh, maybe some of those were on television preaching and not saved. I don't know. Yeah, there was a guy I used to work with and I was sitting there talking to him and he knew I went to church and stuff and he started getting into church. Him and his wife were going and they had just started going and he was like, you know what, I found out a preacher makes decent money sometimes if you get into doing it full time and everything. I was like, okay, I mean, what's that have to do with anything? And, well, you know, I think I might get into preaching. Uh, that's not the reason you should go into preaching. Uh, uh, old Herbert Armstrong. Oh, yeah. Hootie called him the uh, Mr. Confusion. <laughs> if you talk to my sister, you can uh, learn where he is. He's been dead, but he's he deceived people, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people all over the world into uh, believing what he believes. And she, you talk to her, she don't know nothing about it. The New Testament, Martha. Uh, it's all about the uh, peace and uh, Old Testament tribes of Israel and all that. She really knows a lot about that. She can probably beat anybody here, uh, you, know, you know, going in just talking about the, uh, the Old Testament peace and stuff. But uh, she don't know how to be saved, and she won't. She won't listen. So she, I start talking to her, and I, I try to get a few words in here and there and uh, well for instance I was talking to her last night after talking to Roselle Mould and Roselle told me that uh, she wasn't worried about the condition she was in she knows where she was going and I told Mike I said uh, Roselle said she was not concerned about you know dying she knew where she was going and she, she was at the point she didn't know what to say You know, we were sitting there talking about the, I mentioned they're making good money. You know, there's a lot of preachers on TV that make great money, but they also preach to what people want to hear, not what they need to hear. So, and you could preach to what everyone wants to hear and make great money out of it, but it doesn't mean they're getting what they need to hear. All right, we'll go ahead and continue. These people attempted to answer their doubt-filled questions from their own limited knowledge. They reason, reasoned by asking questions to which they thought they knew the answers. Jesus was not the carpenter's son. These people were ignorant of the fact that Joseph was Jesus' stepfather. They ignored what had happened years ago in Bethlehem. Of course, James, Hosea, Simon, Judas, and several ladies were the brothers and sisters of Jesus. Those who asked the question already knew all these, all this. They reasoned that because they knew Jesus' family, they could not be as wise or as powerful as he seemed. Sadly, they rejected Jesus, and he was not able to do many mighty works there. Jesus did heal some sick folks, but by, but by and large, Nazareth rejected his ministry. They passed up countless blessings because they would not believe that Jesus was who he said, and he who said he was or that he could do what he said he could do. Anything else before we go to a final word? All right, we'll go ahead and get through this. The truth of Hebrews eleven sixteen is revealed in each one of these parables. Hebrews eleven sixteen says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder 
of those who diligently seek him. I think I might have read that already. Maybe not. Nope, that was just the verse. Sounds really close to it. Faith is necessarily in, nece, necessary in order to receive and understand the word of God. The good soil was receptive soil that was not cult, cultured by the rocks Word. and thorns of an evil world. A heart that is honestly open to God's word will find it easy to believe in Jesus Christ and trust him as Savior and Lord. Without faith, we will never realize the blessings of the kingdom. The man, the man who sold everything to buy the field had faith that there was a treasure. There even when others did not believe it. The merchant had faith that a pearl of great price was available and that he could obtain something unique and very valuable. His faith led him to invest all he had. The fishermen had faith that their nets would bring in the good vessels and that their efforts would bring a reward. They could discard the bad and keep the good and find profit in their labor. These parables were not, the parables were taken from the everyday lives of the people who heard them. They were still resonant. They are still resonant in our hearts today. There are still farmers who must prepare the soil for planting. There are still businessmen who seek to find the treasures that others cannot see and invest in them. If we will learn from Jesus and receive the word into our hearts, we will then have the faith to see the great treasures that are uniquely present in the New Testament church, churches that Jesus purchased with his own blood. All right. Any thoughts or comments on the lesson? All right. We have a few more minutes, so if you all want, we can go ahead and go over the class discussion questions here. First one is, what was the conclusion in the three parables given in verses 44 through 50? Grow in faith and, and, do, what, and eat, oh, what, <clears throat> do what's necessary to grow in faith and then to sell out to it. And being faithful to it. The church too, a good Bible believing church, growing in that church. You know, there's a lot of people that say you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to go to a church to be saved, and they're right. But if you're saved, you should go to a church. It's going to help you grow. You, know, you can sit at home, and that's a lot of where you do backsliding is when you just sit at home and you start to think, well, you know. I'll sit here, you know, maybe I don't have to read my Bible today. And maybe the next day you're like, you know what, I have a little bit more time when I don't read it. You know, I can go without it there too. And before you know it, you're not reading your Bible. You're not praying as much as you should. You're backsliding. You know, that's what a church is there for, you know, it's to support and encourage each other to keep growing. What is the old and new treasure mentioned in verse 52? Old Testament, New Testament. Verse 52 there, it says, Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed under the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasures things new and old. What would you say there, Jeff? Old Testament, New Testament, New Teaching of Jesus. Yeah. You can learn from both. Both are usable in your lives. Why did the people of Nazareth not accept Jesus' ministry? Because they thought they already knew him. They thought they knew who he was. He was just that boy of Joseph and Mary, the carpenter's son. He was the carpenter's son. They didn't look at what his real dad was. You know, they seen the earthly dad that they looked at, who was his stepdad, you know, they They don't they don't know that he's that stepdad. No. Yeah. But they, they thought they knew him already. Right. They knew who he was. And just like I said, the prophet's not, not without honor, saying his own country. And it, sometimes it's hard to minister in the community that you grew up in because people seen you growing up. And 
they think that they know you they know oh you're just that kid or <laughs> why did Jesus not do many mighty works in Nazareth of their unbelief they didn't believe so he done a few by what it said there but he didn't do much all right well we got about six or seven more minutes we'll go ahead and dismiss class we'll meet back here in a few minutes